My name is Friar Jude Winkler and I'm one of the conventional Franciscan friars. And this is the first of a series of videos that we're going to do on the Gospel of Matthew. Now the Gospel of Matthew is the Gospel that's used during year A. The Sunday readings are divided into three separate groups. Year A is Matthew, year B is Mark, and year C is Luke. And seeing that beginning with, with the uh, liturgical new year at the end of 2019, we're beginning year A, it's a good time to look at this gospel. And even if you look at it in the future, it's a good gospel to reflect upon. Now, the tradition is, is that Matthew was written by Matthew, the tax collector, and that it was the first gospel written, and that it was written in Aramaic. Let's deal with the question of, it was the first gospel written. As you notice when you open the New Testament, Matthew is the first gospel that you come across. And that's because of this ancient tradition, we put it as the first gospel. But it's very obvious when you study Matthew and you study Mark, that one borrowed from the other. Mark is a relatively short gospel, around 660 verses, whereas Matthew is a much longer gospel, around 1,600 verses. Mark is written in poor Greek, a lot of grammatical mistakes. Matthew, written in very good Greek. Mark is sort of tossed together, stories that are pasted together, whereas Matthew is a highly organized gospel. It makes a lot more sense to go from a short, poorly written, poorly organized gospel to a longer, better written, better organized gospel than vice versa. Furthermore, the tradition said that Matthew was written in Aramaic, and yet the Gospel of Matthew that we now have was clearly written in Greek. The reason we know that is that there's word plays that only work in Greek. So we now believe that while Matthew, the tax collector, might have contributed to this gospel, there was a second author who came along later on and completed the gospel. Who was that second author? We really don't know, but Matthew's gospel has a lot of quotations from the Old Testament and treats the Old Testament law with sacred respect. Given that, we suspect that the author of the gospel of Matthew, the second author, might have been a converted Pharisee. Remember, the Pharisees were very rigorous in their observance of the law. They knew the Old Testament by heart. So we suspect that somebody came along later on, possibly around 85 AD, took what Matthew the Apostle had written, probably in Aramaic, and expanded it. How much did Matthew the Apostle actually write? Probably only about 350 verses. Whereas the rest of it, 1,250 verses, was written by the second author or gathered by him from his various sources. Now, why did he write the gospel? He wrote the gospel in response to a crisis in the community. Up to 70 AD, the Christians believed that they were part of the Jewish body. They continued to go to the synagogues, the temples, and although there were local difficulties, in general, Christians considered themselves to be Jews. Jews who believed that Jesus was the Messiah, but nevertheless Jews. In 70 AD, the Romans destroyed the temple in Jerusalem. And once the temple was destroyed, the focal point for Judaism disappeared. The Jewish rabbis realized that they had to redefine what it meant to be a Jew. So they met in a small town near called Jamnia, and they came up with three major decisions. Decision number one, they threw out the old translation of the Hebrew Bible in Greek called the Septuagint. The reason they threw it out is that Christians were using it. Decision number two, they decreed that only those books written in Hebrew or Aramaic would be considered part of their Bible. And that excludes books like Wisdom, Sirach, Tobit, etc. Those are books that are contained in the Catholic and Orthodox Bible but are not contained in the Protestant Bible, because when Martin Luther came along, he accepted the rabbi's definition of the books contained in the Old Testament, which is kind of odd, because the church had used those books for 1,500 years. And in fact, Jesus himself quotes from them. It's odd that Martin Luther would exclude them. 
but he did that. And then the third decision that the rabbis made, sometime around 80 AD, was to exclude Christians from the synagogue. They wrote a prayer of the faithful. Their prayer of the faithful was called the 18 benedictions. And the prayer went more or less, may heretics die immediately, may Christians burn in hell forever, we pray to the Lord. Not very ecumenical. Well, if you were suspected of being a Christian, you were asked to say that prayer in front of the synagogue. And if you refused, if you even stuttered, then you were kicked out of the synagogue. Christians were kicked out of the synagogue. They were told that they were going to hell and being kicked out of the synagogue meant that they were no longer Jews. The Jewish people were able to worship freely in the Roman Empire. If you're no longer a Jew, you weren't able to, and you faced martyrdom. Christian people faced martyrdom and shunning in this life and damnation in the next. Second Matthew, whoever he was, most probably wrote the Gospel of Matthew to respond to that situation. He wanted to tell Christians that they weren't heretical Jews. They were the new Israel, the true Israel, because they believed in the Messiah whom Yahweh had sent. And in fact, all throughout his gospel, 2 Matthew goes out of his way to show that we're the true Israel. Over and over again, he shows how New Testament figures are already prefigured in the Old Testament. For example, Baby Moses is endangered in Egypt, and Pharaoh tries to kill him. Baby Jesus is endangered. Remember the slaughter of the holy innocents, and Herod tries to kill him. Moses starts, starts in Egypt. Jesus en ends up in Egypt when the holy family flees down there. Moses fasts 40 days on the mountain. Jesus fasts 40 days in the desert. Moses receives the law of Israel on the mountain. Jesus gives the new law, new law for the new Israel and the Sermon on the Mount. So over and over again, we see that Jesus is the fulfillment of the promises of the Old Testament. That's why over and over again in the Gospel, we hear quotations from the Old Testament, which by itself is another reason why we don't believe that Matthew the tax collector wrote all of this, because tax collecting was an unclean profession. You couldn't even study the law. How would Matthew know all these quotations from the Old Testament? So all throughout this year, we're going to be looking at the Gospel of Matthew, a very Jewish gospel, a gospel that shows that Jesus is the fulfillment of all the promises Yahweh had ever made. It'll be an interesting journey because it presents a Jesus who is not quite the Jesus of Luke's gospel, Jesus the social worker, Jesus the compassionate man, or of Mark, Jesus who's in a rush to proclaim his message, or in John, Jesus who's clearly divine. In the Gospel of Matthew, Jesus is the Jewish sage. He's the rabbi who's presenting a new law for the new Israel. In fact, Matthew, being a good rabbi, collected his material very carefully. And so he has all of Jesus' teachings in one section and then his action in another. And then he goes back to teaching and then action. How many sections of teaching does Matthew present in his gospel? Five sections, just like the Pentateuch, the first five books of the Bible. This is a new Pentateuch, a new Torah for the new Israel. And may God bless us.